Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming out today. It's lovely to see you in person. Um, I don't know about you, I find it very strange seeing people again after 18 months. Uh, people either smaller or shorter or taller. And it completely throws me, but it is good to actually be interacting again, so thank you. Um, welcome to the ninth Food Service Growth Report uh, that Alec Partners have been leading since 2013, and which EP has been supporting. You're very welcome. Um, I think we have a number of really interesting topics and speakers today, and I think there's all kinds of questions that we want to explore. And again, we want to make this as interactive as possible, so please, you have lots of... Uh, please ask any questions you have the opportunity to, uh, because again, I think the more, the more that everyone talks about these issues, the more we learn and the more we, get, we actually find the answers. Uh, before we start, may I thank Compass, who have been hoping, uh, acting as our host of this venue and the catering today. Mm -hmm and uh, very much appreciated, and thank you very much indeed. Um, it's been a thought-provoking piece. First problem of the day, sadly, our main presenter, our host, who got struck down by COVID, Graham Smith, the managing director of Alex Partners, so he will be streamed in live uh, for his presentation. Um, so please ask as many difficult questions of him as possible, um, but it will be, obviously, um, going through that presentation, which Lauren will be introducing in a few moments' time. Uh, we also have a number of other really interesting speakers, including Kate Nichols, Chief Executive of UK Hospitality, who's going to talk to us about the people issue and some of the key issues that we're all thinking about at this moment in time with the challenges that we restart. Dean Kennett, founder of Fooditude, uh, who's gone, going to talk about his journey and his experiences and his insights. And then we have a fascinating panel. Again, I have apologies from Katie, who is the Global Marketing Director of Rhubarb, who sadly had a family crisis last night and sadly can't be with us, but we have Helen Milligan-Smith, UK Managing Director of Aramark, joining us. Uh, Darren C., who is Country Manager for UK and Europe for Russell Partnership. Um, and Ian Craner, uh, who is the Chief Marketing Officer and New Food Channels Director for Compass. I haven't got that quite right. I'll get that right for you, Ian, as we go. Um, but we get, particularly when to look at things like sustainability, because Darren's just come back from COP26, so what were his impressions of that? And Darren used to, obviously, be based at Expo in Dubai 2020. And again, which is a big sustainability piece. And sustainability is going to be one of the key themes that we want to explore today. So again, again, questions to be asked, I think, about how that's going to impact on us as we go forward. So I look forward to that panel session as well. Um, we do face great challenges. Uh, we've actually done some research with a lot of you in this room today, pre to this event, and we'll be releasing that research result as part of Graham's uh, feedback and report. And I think you'll be quite interested by some of the results. So we've, we've been talking to operators, to consultants, and to clients as well, which is probably the first time we've done it. So it'll be interesting to get that kind of feedback, and again, get your reaction to that. So welcome today. Uh, we'll try and guide you through as well as is possible. Uh, it should be a really interesting hour and a half. Now, we're going to try and get you out by 10.40, for those who want to get out before 11 o'clock. For those who would like to stay around, there is going to be the staff at the QE2 Centre are going out to the main lawn at the front at 11 o'clock. Big Ben is going to chime for the first time in a while at 11 o'clock, and you are very welcome to join them if you so wish. And this should be quite an interesting experience to watch. So please be very welcome. Lauren, can I pass over to you? Thank you, Chris. And absolutely, I'm just to reiterate, it's such a pleasure to see you all again. And you're right, Chris has shrunk. Um, <laughs> if you are <laughs> you're measuring him against um, and others, um, our industry, we are facing massive headwinds. We all know that. Whether it's from labour shortages, we've got supply chain issues, we've got issues with uncertain return to work patterns. But there are also lots of positives. We have got huge opportunities, especially as caterers and especially as an industry as a whole, to create positive change and to create value, add value to our clients and to the end users. From everything from sustainability to digitalization to looking at our talent pools and ensuring a, a solid talent pool for the future. There is massive opportunities for positive change, but also massive opportunities for collaboration. And we're seeing a lot of that with partnerships and, and real partnerships. 
Now, hopefully, Graham will be streamed through um, on Zoom. Graham, Managing Director of Alex Partners, you will know him very well. And yes, I'm sorry that he is with COVID and hopefully in slippers. Um, we are very grateful to the team here at the QE2. They've been incredible with uh, last minute uh, Zoom enablement. Um, so if I could ask them to, to start patching Graham in. Now, as Chris mentioned, we at EP have um, been very privileged to be hosting this event for the last nine years. It's such an important event. Just chatting to a lot of you this morning, it is something that you do value, the research that we, we put in and the outcomes um, that we share in this is, is invaluable. So very grateful that we've been able to do this again and to be able to do it in person, which is wonderful. Um, Thank you again to those who were able to support us in that research. It was really invaluable. And Graham is going to be able to um, share that with us now. So Graham, I hope you're feeling well, and I hope you're there. <laughs> um, just checking whether you can hear me in the room now. Yes, absolutely, loud and clear. Great stuff. And um, well, this didn't quite go to plan. Um, I certainly wasn't intending when we would uh, managed to get the first uh, return in person for this event for you to all be in the room and me to be sat at home um, that, that uh, yeah it's pretty disappointing and I'm uh, uh, yeah it's a shame I'm not there to to enjoy catching up with you all um, in person as it has been uh, quite some time but uh, as uh, Lauren and, and Chris have said thank you all very much for continuing to support this event um, we're very glad to host it and obviously appreciative to EP for their support and, and then Compass also for, for hosting us uh, today uh, and also for my team for all the work they do to, to pull this all together. So thank you. Um, so for the session uh, today, what I'm going to uh, to cover is uh, some reflections on some of the key issues that we're, we're seeing in the market uh, at the moment, uh, but then also to uh, provide you with the results of the, the survey. That we, uh, that we issued ahead of this event. And the idea of the survey really was uh, in the absence of any you know, meaningful financial metrics yet coming out of the, the industry post-crisis, is to really get a sense of um, people's outlook and um, the, the temperature of the industry around some uh, particular topics. And hopefully the output of that helping to um, inform some of the discussion that uh, takes place later on in the day uh, as well. So just picking up on some of the, the key trends that we see uh, going across food service, so catering and, and hospitality. Um, first of all, it's clear to everybody that, that COVID-19 has accelerated a number of trends which are already uh, existing in the industry. Uh, health and wellness, you know, was was on people's minds ahead of the crisis, but its focus has only been heightened uh, by the impact. But also the acceleration of the use of, of digital tools um, when it was necessary to be able to uh, to be contactless, to pre-book. Um, then, you know, the the acceleration of the use of, of apps, of QR codes, um, of pre-ordering, you know, all of those things which had been on people's minds ahead of the crisis, then the, the implementation of those are absolutely accelerated. But I think also what we've seen as we emerge from the crisis is it's triggered the evolution of some of the business models, uh, and particularly in, in BNI. I think it's required BNI providers and the clients actually to really kind of sit down together and figure out how they can make it work. Um, and what we have absolutely seen is um, it, it, a much greater prevalence of more of a cost plus style arrangement in that particular market um, and more of a partnership approach. So interesting to see whether um, you know, that continues into the longer term. Education, healthcare and defence have been um, flavours of the day. The, the resilience through the, um, through the crisis has been apparent uh, to all. We also see this coming through some of our survey uh, results. But as we sit now at the, at the start of the, the recovery cycle, um, then I do think that there's you know, renewed interest again looking at, at BNI because that's a way to really ride that um, recovery wave, uh, whereas education, healthcare, defence have been kind of much more resilient and closer to their 2019 levels already. 
The third point I've raised here is around this opportunity post crisis for caterers to kind of partner with their clients. And um, I think we'll come back to this a few times during the day, but there's an alignment of interest here in terms of key business objectives that clients have, uh, such as you know, attracting the workforce back to the workplace um, and also meeting ESG goals, which you know, these are areas, two areas, and there are others as well, where caterers, hospitality providers can actually help their clients achieve these goals. So more of a, a, a partnership approach. Um, and when we come to some of the results on the survey, then this will bear this out. And the final point on here is, as many as you know, that I'm a, a corporate finance and an M&A specialist. So this is, uh, is always great for me to hear is that um, you know, the mindsets, mindsets are definitely shifting now from survival through to, to growth. Um, and as we look at that growth, then we do see as moving into 2022, that M&A will, will form a greater part of that, again, as, uh, as people look to get back to, to growing their business and take advantage of the recovery. So I'm going to move on now on to the, the results of the, the survey questions that we, uh, that we asked. And thank you to everybody who, uh, who responded to that. We had a, a really great response that's given us some, some rich data. Uh, we will share this data um, you know, with, the, with everybody after this meeting, so no need to furiously scribble down uh, percentages or numbers or anything like that. So I'll just take you through the key headlines of that. So the first question we asked was around return to the office. So in comparison to 2019, where do we see office attendance in 2022 being? Um, and this is on a sliding scale of dark blue being it would be back to 2019. As you see on the charts, we don't see anybody expecting it to be back to 2019 levels. Dark blue, 75 to 100%. Um, light blue, 50 75 and green less than 50. Um, we've also split this between operators and then the clients and, and consultants. And what's interesting to see there is that actually the, the operators are, are more pessimistic um, when it comes to the return to the office, um, with 26% of operators thinking that actually return to the office will be less than 50% uh, of the levels of 2019 in 2022, whereas the clients and the consultants have only 9% think that will be the case. So maybe some cause for optimism there. Second question we asked was, um, for people to, to rank and uh, the recovery of sectors um, in 2022 relative to 2019. So um, number one on the rankings would be the, the, the area with the strongest recovery relative to 2019. And the size of the bubbles on this chart show the number of uh, votes that each, um, uh, each area had in this space. So whilst healthcare and education there are one and two, um, the bubble sizes are very close. So they were, they were both ranked very close to the top of the, uh, of the list there. Um, and we see that in terms of the resilience that the sectors have experienced. And at the other end of the spectrum, then events and, and B&I being seen as those which will still be very much on that recovery curve in 2022. Then we asked people about the main challenges that they saw for the UK food service sector. Again, the first uh, on the list being the biggest challenge that people were experiencing or saw at the moment. So as we see from this, no, no surprise in terms of what, what captures the, the newspaper's attentions in terms of labor shortage, supply chain, then that is absolutely coming through in what people are experiencing. Uh, in the industry, um, and it's why we're really pleased to have Kate Nichols uh, presenting uh, later from UK Hospitality, have really been at the forefront of, um, uh, of lobbying with government uh, and the like around, you know, what needs to be done to address some of these issues, and particularly around labour and, uh, and talent. Um, cost inflation actually lower down uh, the list and you know, this may be a little bit of, um, of timing of the question certainly we're seeing uh, a significant uptick 
in cost inflation uh, at the moment. So uh, whether that position on this uh, particular list would, would move if we asked the question today, um, not quite sure. But absolutely, labour labor being the number one challenge in the market that everybody is wrestling with. Then what we looked at was uh, what, what are the initiatives, what are the activities in the market um, which, are, which are most important? Uh, what does the industry need to be doing and focusing on? Again, the, the first on the list being the most important. And we split this between operators and, and clients and consultants again, just to see how that aligns. Um, so from an operator perspective, environmental sustainability, food waste, uh, number one uh, area of focus, uh, closely followed by health and wellness and the use of digital tools, hygiene protocols, diversity inclusion and reducing cost to serve so that kind of cost focus um you know coming coming last on that particular list so how does this change when we look at it from the client perspective now we can see things moving around there a little bit other than the fact that the environmental sustainability and food waste remains number one in the eyes of the clients and, and consultants and that aligns with the way that uh, operators are, are looking at it Hygiene protocols actually move up um, to, to second place on this list. Uh, some of this may well be because you know, operators have already invested heavily in this and they, um, you know, they've been very focused on making sure that their, uh, their provision uh, is safe and, and hygienic, where, of course, it always just stays on the mind of, of clients when thinking about their staff. Um, digital tools and the use of digital tools very much on the agenda uh, for clients. Um, and reducing cost to serve, again, lower down the list, but um, it, it is a, a greater focus for clients than for, for the operators, but certainly um, you know, nowhere near the level of response that we had there on those uh, top, uh, top four responses there. So you know, this, this drives this comment around uh, the ways that operators can really kind of partner with their clients to focus on areas that add value to the client. And it's not just about taking cost out of the out of the provision. So I think actually that uh, enables operators to maybe change that discussion, the conversation, uh, creates the opportunity to have a better quality of business coming out of this particular crisis. Uh, corporate events, I think these have absolutely been in the, the eye of the storm in terms of uh, the ability to uh, to both host these and also uh, corporate's propensity to uh, to spend on them. And how does this look from 22 relative to 19? Well, I think what's clear from this is that um, actually from a client perspective, if we look at the, the orange uh, bars there, that suggests um, an expectation of 2022 being significantly below 2019, with green being below and the blues being you know, at or above. And we can see there from the clients and the industry advisors, the consultants, that 81% think that their expenditure will be uh, below or significantly below 2019. Um, uh, and perhaps a less pessimistic view taken by the uh, the BNI operators. So um, I think this is this is going to be a continued area of, of volatility, and it may just be a bit of prudence. Uh, from clients at the moment as they look forward to 2022. They're not quite sure what budgets will be, et cetera, et cetera. But certainly in my experience, then um, when events have been held, um, then take up has been incredibly strong. People have been very keen to see each other again in person. So I think actually this could be an area where we, uh, we get a positive surprise in 2022. So in the absence of the, uh, the profit tracker that we, um, we've typically been producing, we thought we'd get some perspectives on where uh, uh, people thought revenues and profits might be in 2022. And we split this between uh, B&I operators, broader caterers, and then venues and events, just to show how the different subsectors um, are, are, are looking. And from a revenue perspective, then, uh, B&I operators most pessimistic there with 77% expecting revenues to be below or significantly below uh, 2019 levels, although a small cohort of in in incredibly optimistic B&I operators in there as well. So that's, um, that's interesting to see. Uh, 
followed by the venues and events operators with 60% uh, expecting revenues to be below where they were in 2019, uh, but 40% expecting to be similar or, or above. And then in the broader caterers, so more of the education, the healthcare, um, defence, government, uh, only 22% uh, of those operators think they'll be below uh, 2019 levels in 2022. So you can see that, that differing experience depending on the market. But what is interesting when we ask this question, same question, but for margin percentages, so the profit percentages, is we're seeing a more positive picture when it comes to the EBITDA margin, so the profitability margins that people are expecting. Um, and that more positive picture, I think, reflects the fact that operators have taken the opportunity to, um, to take cost out of their, their, their operations, drive efficiencies, uh, maybe come to, to better deals with their, with their clients. Um, so actually, as we, as we emerge from the crisis, again, this potential to create a, a higher quality uh, business because of changes that have happened through the crisis. So in conclusion, yeah, we do see 2022 continuing to be a recovery uh, year. Um, obviously, it's uh, been an incredibly difficult time over the last 18 months, but that you know, recovery is continuing. One of the key themes coming out of this is, is very much this opportunity for, for caterers to partner with their clients to really help them achieve their clients' goals around things like return to the workplace and ESG goals, things where the, the caterer and the hospitality provider can really make a difference. And this concept of, uh, of becoming a, a value center and not a cost center. So how, how can you be an activity that drives value for the client? Um, and that can just help drive a, a much better economic outcome actually for the, uh, uh, for the, the food service provider. Um, and also this, this point has came through the survey that whilst 2022 revenues are in many cases expected to be below the levels that people were at in 2019, margin percentages have improved, improved. So the ability for profitability to recover more quickly than that top line, I think is important as people look uh, to the future. And, and also from all my conversations around the market, the focus is now very much on, on growth. Um, and I do think we can expect to see more M&A activity as we head into 2022. Um, so thank you very much. I hope that's been um, a helpful uh, step through that. And as I say, we will share the results and uh, Apologies again for not being able to be in the room with you. I'm hugely disappointed uh, about that. But um, Chris, back to you in the um, in the room. I escaped before I asked him a question. Quite sensible. Um, now I have a pleasure to introduce Kate Nichols, Chief Executive of UK Hospitality. I think Kate's done widely been respected and admired for the work she's been doing over the last last few years now with government, um, but has obviously quite a unique insight to the challenges we face. So Kate, please. Thank you. I, I don't have slides, so I'll come and stand up here so it's easier if I just keep still for you a little bit. And, and I do hate to be the person who always drags things back down, but I always get put into the slot that is to come and talk to you about the slightly doom and gloom bit that, that might knock the shine off what Graham has said. So Graham's just presented sort of some, some really positive, optimistic notes, and I think there is a, a lot we're seeing that, that resonates across the wider hospitality market that, that I represent over and above caterers that shows that there is that positivity, there is that optimism amongst the industry that uh, things could get better in, in 2022. And certainly what we're seeing over 2021 as we've reopened all of the sectors is that demand remains strong, consumer sentiment remains strong, spend per head is, is, is doing quite well. Um, however, I do think we still have some significant cost headwinds um, and I think we may find that that uh, optimistic note about margin might not prove to be true unless we can get some solutions around labour. So there's a lot that I could talk to you about, but I've only got 10 minutes um, and I'm going to focus particularly on the labour challenges and try and draw in, although we're looking at contract catering in particular here, try and draw in the, the broader experience we've got from across our membership. So, so UK Hospitality 
is the trade body that represents the breadth of hospitality operators from single site, independent pubs, bars, coffee shops, cafes, restaurants, hotels, right the way through to the largest national chains. And obviously we do also have uh, the contract catering alongside it. So we have that perspective across the breadth of consumer sentiment uh, and the breadth of operational sentiment. So if we're just looking down at the labour issue, it is the number one issue. We do regular monthly confidence surveys with our members to find out the, the issues that are preoccupying businesses as we come out of COVID and the challenges that we are facing. And I think the labour issue has percolated right up to the top of, of the, the, the concerns that we've got as we've come out and we've reopened since July. Uh, starting with staff absences and the pandemic that had quite a lot of publicity and the challenges that we had navigating that, but actually the underlying staff shortages that we've got within the sector and across the wider sector. And it is a case at the moment that you are seeing a lot of robbing Peter to pay Paul uh, across the industry as people try to navigate their way out of this and try to find their way through the labour shortages. So what we're seeing at the moment from our, our member surveys and it, it's pretty unchanged since July. We have an underlying vacancy rate within the sector of about 10%. It's fluctuated a little bit, but that is 49% higher than it was pre-COVID. So we all knew that we had labor challenges as we went into COVID. We had almost full employment. Uh, we had some particularly acute challenges around chefs, but coming out of COVID, 49% higher vacancy rate. That equates to roughly 188,000 workers that we are short within the industry. And although we've uh, seen some fluctuations since July around the seasonal nature of the businesses that we represent, uh, and particularly as we've seen broader areas reopening September, October, when BI and, I and, and uh, uh, the, the education sector came back in, in greater full strength, it, it's underlying 188,000 vacancies. Uh, it, it's, it's gone as high as 220. And the ONS figures also bear that out. So they're, they're a lagging uh, figure from our own industry data. So the, the ONS figures that are coming out are, are reinforcing that. And I think hospitality particularly hit by a double whammy. And I wanna touch not just on our own challenges within our own sector, what's in our own control, but at the moment, the, the biggest thing that, that, that's facing a challenge for the operators as they reopen is the double whammy of the supply chain too. And all of the supply chain issues that we are facing and seeing in hospitality, the underlying cause is a labor shortage. Um, so it's not just our own labor that we've got a shortage of and that's preventing us from being able to operate fully and at full capacity, it's also our supply chain. And that's really resulting in some really burgeoning cost pressures that are coming through uh, and, and an intense margin squeeze on the operators as a result. And that margin squeeze more intense, the, the, the less ability you have to pass that cost price inflation on to, to customers. So what we're seeing at the moment is that in the supply chain, you've got about 80% fulfillment. So 20% not being delivered. We've got away from the fact that deliveries are not happening, but at the moment deliveries are, are late, they're slow, and they are not complete. Uh, and it's very unpredictable as to what the, 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 the missing elements are, are going to be. And it's becoming more acute as we get closer to Christmas. So the ability to guarantee delivery of product and stock into operators significantly constrained. That in turn is having a knock-on effect on the ability of the operators to operate at full capacity themselves. A quarter of our businesses across hospitality are, are having to close restaurant space, covers, not operate at full capacity in the larger event spaces, not offer massive events uh, and, and a num significant number of events. So hotels, canceling conferences, not taking big corporate bookings. Again, at the, the larger stadiums and, and larger event spaces that, that we've got within membership, again, they're capping capacity. Um, so they're not operating at full capacity and they are turning business away as a result of that. Over the hospitality sector as a whole, the labor shortage in our own businesses and in the supply chain is meaning that around 20% of revenues that would have been coming in are being foregone. So that's a significant cap on the ability of hospitality to recover. And in turn, that's knocking on to, to cost price inflation that's coming through the supply chain. So immediate steps that operators have taken in the labor market, <coughs> excuse me, you've seen cost price inflation coming through on wages. We did a, a recent tracker, wage rate inflation in the sector currently running at about 11 to 13%, depending on how many people are having to be recruited new from start or, or, or what you're doing with your existing workforce. So 13% is, is the wage rate inflation that you're seeing for existing retained staff, 11% for new starters, and 20% of our staff did not return from furlough, and that's been consistent across all segments of the hospitality market. 20% not returning, 
uh, a large proportion of that split into three largely um, people who were abroad at Christmas and haven't returned because of travel restrictions people who've been dislocated within the UK so students in the wrong place at the wrong time for that casual labor market foreign students also not back in uh, but also a lot of young people leaving city centers during COVID where they had prolonged periods of furlough and are now in the wrong part of the country to come back to work so we have a dislocation there uh, and then the third segment that we had was was people who'd found jobs in other parts of the economy when they were furloughed and able to have second jobs and with Amazon currently paying 22 pounds an hour for um, Christmas fulfillment you can see where that displacement is happening and it's happening across the sector when I talk to colleagues in retail in farming in food manufacturing in processing outside of the food supply chain as well you're seeing those labor shortages you've got a million vacancies across the economy as a whole half a million in food supply that farm to fork that I've just described and about 188 200,000 in hospitality so you can see it's not just a hospitality issue but if we are the last people in the economy to open we are going to have the smallest pool of labor to choose from and we are going to have to pay higher prices to be able to attract those people. So the other immediate steps that we've seen operators take, wages alone not sufficient to be able to, to compete at that level with the likes of Amazon, as I say, uh, but we're also seeing a, a sort of a, a review and a COVID reset moment to be able to look again at terms and conditions, ways of working, styles of working, uh, and the challenges that we've got there. So all in all, <clears throat> as, as I say, before I turn to, to what we are doing to try and, and talk to the government about it and talk to operators about it, because it's, it's a, a sort of co-created solution, you're seeing an artificial constraint on our ability to be able to grow as an economy and to trade our way out of COVID. And that is likely to continue throughout 2022, absent any major interventions. And you have a significant squeeze at the moment for the next six months. So there are, the immediate solutions are the only ones that we can play with are in our own hands. There is nothing that is being looked at from a government perspective as we unwind COVID that is going to help in, in addressing this immediate uh, squeeze that we've got. So I think for, for the short term and the immediate term, we are going to see a, a constraint on demand and the ability to trade our way, but you're also going to see an intense margin squeeze as you come out of that because you've got that constraint on demand and cost prices rising. Cost prices in the supply chain, producer price increases that we're seeing coming through, we tracked it recently, it's about 13% at the moment. So 11 to 13% on labor, 50 to 100% on utilities for anybody who's renewing their contracts at the moment. If you are locked in, you're safe from that, but it's going to come down the line and it's going to hit the supply chain as well. Uh, and that's feeding through into the, to the, the labor challenges. We understand those are similar levels of inflation that, that other parts of the supply chain are facing on labor. Uh, uh, so overall, 13% cost price inflation that is building, eventually that's gonna have to be passed on to consumers. The challenge then we have is that that will feed into an inflationary spiral and that will make the debt that we've all come out of um, less sustainable. I told you I was going to be the Cassandra and knock off the shine from that positivity. Does it, you know, if we're seeing that already in the businesses that opened in April and May and they're struggling with that, then it is going to feed all the way through and it is going to make 2022 a really difficult, challenging environment. And debt, I think, is going to be the single biggest grey rhino that we've got running through it if we can get through with labour. So in terms of trying to work our way out of this conundrum, because it is sort of slightly insoluble and there is this growing pressure valve uh, and there's no release for it. The, the only release would be if we, we freed up the labor market. The government is not looking at doing that in the short term. So we are going to have to live with what we've got for the short term. The reason for that is that the government is instinctively cautious, civil service this is I'm talking about rather than political ministers, instinctively cautious. They know that we've pressed control alt delete on the global economy these are global challenges that we're facing and there will take time for it to resolve there are also quite some big uncertainties that graham touched on about return to work return to the office city center recovery how are events going to come back overlaying that there's this inherent caution around a winter what happens this winter what happens when we come to january and february which are now predicted to be the tightest months and how quickly can we move towards an encouragement that we are back to normal probably not until March, April. So there's no desire from a government, there's no intent from a government to be able to move more quickly than that to free up demand constraints, particularly the labor one, because you don't want people rushing back too quickly. You don't want to disrupt the public health message and you don't want to feel as though you, you are, are introducing new levers when this might be a temporary solution or a temporary uh, situation. So that's the big issue that government is grappling with at number 10 and number 11, and you have a slightly schizophrenic government in, 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 in this case. Number 11 is judging it by the number of jobs we create and sustain and, and keep coming out of the um, 
for COVID recovery. Number 10 is looking at wages. Uh, and so you're not wanting to move on any of the issues that might help us as a sector or help the global economy generally on labour issues until you can resolve that conundrum at the top of government. But that's what we're looking at. So nothing immediate, but we are continuing to press for it and we are continuing to make the case. So there is a growing understanding within government now that there are simply insufficient people within the labour market. So one of the things we're working really closely with the Cabinet Office on is to look at the supply chain, the challenges that you've got. There's a sort of big focus within government about saving Christmas. Um, if I hear somebody say save Christmas, I, I might scream again, but you know, I'm trying to look at how do we get to April. Um, the Cabinet Office is now doing a really deep dive on the labour market, uh, which is something that we've been asking them to do since June or July. The so top of government does not know how many people we have available in the labour market in the UK. We don't track it, we don't measure it, we track unemployment, we track employment, but we don't know how many people have left the UK during COVID because we don't have we're right to work records for everybody who's moved in and out of the UK. So we know 1.5 million EU citizens who had a right to work left the UK during COVID and have not returned. We don't know how many who were undocumented or didn't have a right to work but still were eligible to work in the UK. We certainly don't know how many Irish people who move around in the common travel area have left the UK and are not coming back to work. So they don't know what the gap is. So we've asked them to do an urgent gap analysis which will s provide the evidence to demonstrate the see we told you so there are just insufficient people in the labour market to keep the economy running at full strength. Finally, they are doing that and it will report to the Prime Minister quickly, but it won't offer immediate solutions in the timescale that we're looking at. So in, in, in a, 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 a addition to that, we're working with DWP on the Job Centre Plus. We've got them to, to run hospitality as a major campaign. So they have all of the, the in, in details that we've got about the, the, the career opportunities, the, the breadth of career opportunities, the higher level, higher skilled jobs, rather than just the entry level that jo Job Centre Plus tends to focus on, so that we can focus on moving people across and they can proactively market hospitality to those people who've been made redundant. That's a big step forward. It's the, it's the only sector of the economy they're doing that with. Uh, and we've equipped them to do that. So those are all their job coaches doing that, particularly around uh, Kickstart as well and apprenticeships. So we're putting in place our own measures to be able to help people and help employers take advantage of the extended funding that is available on Kickstart and apprentices that runs now until April. The government will provide the funding for that. So we're, we're doing that job matching uh, there as well. Um, and, and we're doing that, that, that work with our HR directors to look at a COVID reset moment. How do we look at terms and conditions and encouraging that? So a lot of that is in employers' own hands, but we are facilitating that to the trade body. So that's the short term. Medium term, we're working with the Department for Education to make sure that we have the, the skills, we have the curriculum, we have the qualifications that are right. We've got uh, the hospitality skills that, that are outside of an apprenticeship finally included in the lifetime skills guarantee so that, that we can focus on, on having the funding to be able to upskill and train our workers. And they're working with us to facilitate management training and uh, future development there. But that will take a long time to come through. And then over and above that, as an industry, what we're doing is, is pulling together to make sure that we have all of the, the um, necessary collateral to do an employer branding uh, message around hospitality as a career. So we will be looking to, to, to launch a major recruitment campaign as UK Hospitality, coordinating it so that we can put a positive uh, approach out towards people. We've done quite a lot of work as individual employers on our employer brand. We've never done it as an industry and we've never done it as a sector. And we do have a habit of talking ourselves down and talking about how difficult it is, how long the hours are, how hard the work is, but we don't celebrate the positivity. And we need to be getting that out there. And we have no collateral at the moment to be able to take out into schools, to colleges, to young people, to be able to promote hospitality as a career of choice and pass the mums test. So that is the medium term objective that we will be working on there. And then finally, longer term, and unfortunately, I mean, by longer term, I'm talking about the end of 2022, because government is only thinking in 100 days at the moment. Um, this is about looking again at having a real labor market strategy. We have a skills strategy from the government. It's not quite fit for purpose. It doesn't quite address our needs in further education. We need to make that fit for purpose, but they don't have a labor strategy. And that's what we need the government to look at longer term is mapping out the labor market. Where are the gaps? What do we need to do to fulfill them? And that in turn will feed through into the immigration proposals. So we're arguing that as an industry, as an economy, we need a COVID reset moment across government as a whole. 
everything that government is doing for our industry or about our industry or to our industry is based on a labour market assessment pre-COVID. We need to urgently map that out post-COVID and put in place policies that suit the new environment, which allow us to grow and allow us as a hospitality sector to go back to operating at full demand, full capacity, generating one in six of net new jobs, 40 billion pounds of tax take to the exchequer, and go back to investing in our people and giving the best of British hospitality and experience at all levels across our businesses. So that's what we will be working on short, medium and long term. Uh, but I'm sorry, I don't have any immediate solutions for you. <laughs> Do you want me to wait for uh, we've, got a, we've got a few minutes. If anyone's got any questions for Kate. And we do have a microphone around. Does anyone like to ask Kate a question? I will start. Kate, one of the things that strikes me from the figures, which are a bit gloom, doom and gloom. Yes, sorry. No, don't worry. <laughs> um, is surely the thing we have to do is compete for the people who are in Europe who haven't come back yet. Is that fair? Yes, and, and one of the things that we're, we're talking to the Home Office about, um, obviously Home Office controls immigration. There is a perception out there that if you had gone home pre-Brexit, and obviously a lot of our workers did, a lot of our workers went home for Christmas and then we closed down the whole of the UK economy and we put travel restrictions in place. So a lot of workers couldn't come back in. Uh, there's six million people who have pre-settled and settled status and the Home Office website erroneously gives the impression that if you've been out of the UK for more than six months, your status is invalid. It isn't as long as you've got residency. So we are talking urgently to the Home Office about contacting all of those people and going back and explaining that if you had got your pre-settled and settled status pre-Brexit and you've been stuck because of COVID, that doesn't count and you can come back in. And so we do need to work, again, it, it's an opportunity to go out and communicate to all of our colleagues who did go home, who did travel abroad. Now the travel restrictions have lifted, come back. We've got a great uh, career opportunity waiting for you. You've got 13% like, increase in wages. Uh, and, and people can come back in. I mean, that's part of it, isn't it? Is this a moment where we actually have to think differently now about how we recruit people in generally? Because of 188,000 vacancies, and you still have quite high unemployment in the city centres, don't you? So you, something's you disconnected. You do, but I mean, across the UK, you've got 4.3% unemployment. Now, the Bank of England uh, anticipated that we would have 7, 7.5% unemployment coming out of COVID. That is what is fixated in the Chancellor's mind we might still have 7% unemployment. And we're trying to say to them, we, we genuinely don't. We've still got 4%. So, so that was the thing that's, that's slightly unexpected. Um, it, in Southwest, it's 3.3%. In London, it's 6.6%. But you've got some specifics about London, Gatwick and Heathrow being two of them, and the city where it hasn't come back. Um, but, but, but they're not the people who are unemployed who are going to be working in the jobs that we're talking about. But 4.3% unemployment is almost full employment. If you then factor in that you, your economy is as tight, your labour market is as tight as it was pre-COVID, but you've lost at least 1.5 million from the workforce that have moved abroad, and you've lost people of working age to COVID, sadly, because you've had deaths, and a lot of people have decided to become economically inactive during that time period. That, to me, is full employment. Fair enough. Now, going quickly on to Graham's thing again about BNI, because a lot of it's about work patterns changing as well. And now I know a lot of people will argue that things will come back during 2022 in workplaces. But actually, the stats don't say that, do they? And actually, it is going to have to change and adapt the models, isn't it? I, I think people are, and we need to take this, this opportunity to, to review that and plan for the future as if it isn't going to come back, because it, it isn't going to come back in the same way. Even if you get people back into offices, they aren't going to be doing nine to five, five days a week. That's not the same as saying they'll be at home. And I think it's a false dichotomy to say it's at home or the office. You might not be working out of your office. You might be working remotely. And there are opportunities there in terms of those satellite offices that people might have. Um, but the government is also looking at reviewing the legislation around flexible working. And I think whether they legislate for it or whether the, the, the workers decide in their own way and their employers decide in their own way, I think t two days a week in the office is going to become, two to three is going to become the new norm. And it, it, two, two days is going to be sort of almost accepted as the minimum, the legal minimum. Um, so, so the government is keen to encourage this. So this will take time. This is an acceleration of a trend and COVID has accelerated a lot of trends. This is one of them. But people do need to start preparing for that because it isn't going to come back in the same way. 
I suppose my question I get to, though, is this is the challenge, isn't it, for the sector and for all hospitality. If you take 75% come back next year, which is what the figures say, and that's at three, two days, three days a week, so you're 20, 30% down straight away in density in the city centres. Then you take out international travel, mm. international business, which equates about 40% spend on hospitality. That's a huge amount of lost revenues that's going to impact on restaurants, hotels, BNI, hospitality, everywhere. Isn't it, it is, and, and it's, the, it's, it's very difficult to be able to predict and to do any strategic long-term planning in, in the face of that uncertainty. And I think we face the potential of a double whammy next year where domestic demand starts to soften. What we've seen over the summer for any of the operators who do sports stadia or, or big music events, footfall high, spend per head, massively up. People have been treating themselves and trading up. As they can now go abroad, does that soften? Does our domestic demand soften? Do people not go out and treat themselves during work, working weeks? And does international take longer to come back? So city centres could have a really significant hit next year. It could be that double whammy. Could also, we've changed habits and we do both. Um, but, but there is the potential there for it, for it to be more um, challenging than, than perhaps. And I think even if you get the revenues up, the margin, the profit margin is, is going to be hammered next year. It isn't it's going to. It's so going basically, to, it's going to be a tough 2020. It's going to be a tough 2022, um, and we need the government to make sure that it's not worse. So we know that's what we're saying to the chancellor. If you don't want inflationary spiral to come out with putting prices up to consumers, or you don't want businesses to go bust because they can't put prices up, but the margin squeeze is so intense that you've made them unviable, you need to give the industry a, a pressure valve. You either need to to sort of keep the 12.5% VAT for those businesses that are in that consumer-facing market so you don't make that worse, or you need to, to free up the labour market and you need to free up immigration to make sure that we can operate at full demand and full capacity. But, but you can't keep the pressure cooking, you can't have that many red lines. Um, and that's, that's the message we're taking to the Chancellor. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Now for a much happier story, I'm thrilled to tell you. Um, on the 2nd of December 2020, Sodexo announced that it had taken a major shareholding in a company called Fooditude, which is a London-based delivered-in food service operator. After 15 years of an adventure, husband and wife team Sam and Dean Kennett were about to start a different adventure. Whilst retaining shareholding in the Fooditude brand, they were going to run this in a slightly different way, but with the same team. Now, Dean and Sam and the Fooditude family have been part of the EP family for many years, and we've been delighted to watch them grow and change. And we've also been delighted to watch them challenge the industry. Now, you all know, um, a successful M&A deal is something to be proud of, but pulling that off in the middle of a global pandemic, that's something really impressive. So Dean, I'd love to hand over to you to tell us of the Fooditude story. I'm not sure if I owe the steps. <laughs> Morning, everyone. Now, I'm gonna follow some notes, if you don't mind. I'm not a seasoned talker. And I think some of you out there will appreciate where the situation I'm in right now. So anyway, good morning. Uh, thanks for having us. And thanks to the EP team and Alex Partners for letting me up and share the stage. And uh, uh, I have to say, uh, Kate, thank you very much for your work in hospitality and helping us get through this, what's been a nightmare for many players in the room. If the imposter syndrome is going to sink in, you're looking at it now. <laughs> so here we go. I am... Dean Kennett, I'm the Managing Director and Founder of Fooditude. And we are a workplace caterer that delivers the food, well, fresh food from our central production kitchen and, and we're based in London and Dublin. Our mantra is to keep people happy no matter what the working day brings. And we, at Fooditude, we just simply feed people happy. Like many of you, I started washing up and it was actually in my nan's hotel in Babacan in Devon. So the marigolds, greasy pans, I've grown up with it all. My mum ran pubs. So that was my kind of um, upbringing. And living in Torquay, the English Riviera, Riviera, there are only uh, a certain amount of jobs you can do, and hotels, restaurants are one of them. I'm just going to skip through my life quickly. I'm not going to bore you of my uh, early years. Uh, my career, what's led me to be up here today, in order to give you all some context as to why I'm stood here now. At the end, I'll share my thoughts on uh, trends, where we are now, 
and our work on sustainability, and a short video at the end, which was in collaboration with Google and the Planet Mark. So my background, normal upbringing, mum and dad, they, um, they fostered over 50 children while I lived with them, which was remarkable, and so, which was great, but sharing holidays, toys, your bedroom, was always very difficult. But I think being raised in that environment instilled in me um, from an early age to always be nice because you just don't know what those people have gone through or what they're about to go through. And that, that's always stayed with me. So I'm very thankful to my parents for giving me that environment to be growing up. I attended Devon Cajun College, did set in, City and Guild 761 Scrape Through Free, and I also did the HCIMA. I've worked in pretty much every area of catering you can, cafes, delis, restaurants, pubs, hotels, race courses, I've pretty much done it all. When I came back from traveling in 1996, I opened the caterer and found a job with Edison Hewitt, contract catering. Now there's a the thing, Monday to Friday, 40 hours a week. For someone that's worked in hotels and restaurants for most of their life, this was a new opening, and something I'd never even heard of. Stuart and John that run Edison Hewitt influenced my next steps and I learned a lot about business and when I look back on those days at Everson Hewitt I have to thank them for giving me the kind of ability to move forward and you know with confidence and do my own thing. Next page. So when I set up my business I learned lots of lessons very very quickly. I realized just how stupidly naive I was. On my first meeting my first accountant I asked him who was going to be paying the wages. He just looked at me and said, who are you? <laughs> I was that stupid. Tax, HMRC, company's house, setting up business. It was all boring for me, actually. All I wanted to do was cook and keep people happy. I'd never worked so hard. I thought I'd worked hard before. But own, owning and running your own business, it's in you. It's with you every day. You don't turn it off. So we went from three staff to 30 very, very quickly over a few years. Erin, my daughter, was born, which was a fantastic. And then what could go wrong? Well, crisis point one, I call it, was September 2008, when Lehman Brothers collapsed and every other company I was looking after seemed to fall by the side as well. We were personally exposed to about a quarter of a million pounds at that time of our own personal money, and it was a very, very difficult time. I remember going to the Ernst & Young creditors meeting uh, to hear my fate of getting 5p in the pound back, which was a hard pill to swallow. And walking back, I remembered that we had our planned Christmas party. Was the party still going ahead? Yes, it was. I needed the staff that I still had with me and the ones that were serving with me to look after them. And so, with regret at the time, I withdrew down my daughter's ISO. That was something very, very difficult, and only now I can actually talk about it, almost. But actually what I learned at that time, when I think back now, if I hadn't have done that, if I hadn't installed that confidence back in my team, I wouldn't be stood up here now like a nervous wreck. It was a dreadful time, and for three years, I didn't pay myself a wage. I wanted to prove that actually, those early years of setting up a business, I could, I could run a business, if you like. I felt like it had been too easy. So I hang on for dear life. It's not all bad. Out of, out of the uh, crisis, pain come, you know, with pain comes innovation. And in 2009, I was left with a van and five staff. We had the use of a kitchen. There were no contracts moving. And it was a very, very difficult time in business at that time. We seeked a cash investor and a non-exec to help us rationalize and look forward, which was a very good decision at the time. And I looked at our assets. I was also watching what was going on in America because the tech scene didn't seem to flop when uh, the financial crisis hit. They were very, very strong. So I took the target and aim to aim for tech companies or exponential growth companies that were under the radar of some of the other caterers, small catering for small outfits. We started with, uh, actually with a law firm in the, to begin with, and this was using our kitchen model with a delivery. They had, they had no kitchen on site. And then I got a call from Yahoo, and very quickly we were catering for 400 people a day on their free food program. 
Excuse me while I just get some more stuff. We built the company back up again from scratch, but we kept our founding principles, which, excuse me, don't do shit food. We rebranded to Fooditude in 2019, and we see ourselves as a one-stop shop, quality food at meetings, workplace settings, pop-up pantries, and uh, pop-ups and pantry services. In our time, we'd built and moved on from four central production units. I think the first unit kitchen we had was half the size of this stage. Our current unit, which sits in South Bermondsey, is 22,000 square foot. And we're very proud of it, and we call it the mothership. We grew to 140 plus staff, 14 vans circling the city, day and night. What could possibly go wrong? Crisis point two. I think we all know where we are on this one. March the 23rd, 2020, lockdown, and the people of this country were asked to stay at home. We lost over 100 staff through this painful and worrying time. The days ahead were dark, but I knew that the lessons learned in 2008, this is going to be longer, it's going to be harder, and it's going to be more painful. So the lessons that I had learned in 2008, I quickly applied to the company. And it wasn't very easy. The salt pot the salt pots of business, as I call it, that was on the table got knocked over when nobody was looking. And those grains of salt fell off the table and have just irreparably gone everywhere else. They're no longer central to the city we were working in. We did serve approximately 50,000 meals uh, to those that were isolating and vulnerable. We set up a, a fund and we worked closely with the fire brigade, as you can see there, Black Watch Fire Brigade. And we also, through doing packaged COVID meals, we developed our own product, which we now call Fuel. And we're very proud of that. Hindsight is a great thing. A 22,000 square foot warehouse, if I had bought some paddle boards and hot tubs, probably would have made a killing. <laughs> but I didn't. We stood fast and we remembered what we were about. So in the background, and just before the end of 2019, a few of the larger catering companies were circling. They were interested in our model and what we were doing. These conversations carried on, and one that stuck out who had a strategic uh, plan was Sodexo. And in December 2020, all done virtually. We didn't, I didn't get wined or dined once. <laughs> didn't get taken out on those meals you used to hear about. There was no secret uh, coffees in coffee shops. It was all done virtually. And um, it was probably one of the greatest strategic decisions I've made as a business. So moving forward, I'm going to try and put a bit more positive spin on this. <laughs> so what does the workplace look like to me? What does it look like for us at Fooditude? And obviously, I'm going to come at it from a slightly different lens. I think what you need is flexibility and scalability in your armor because everything is so uncertain and will be for many years to come. Hybrid working, working from home, plan B, and dare I say another potential lockdown are all in the mix. <clears throat> Uncertainty rules. It's certainly time to put the stabilizers on. But there's also an abundance of opportunity too. While some companies are starting to relook at their workplaces and real estates, nothing to my mind has settled in this area. They're all on the fence a bit. Some back 100%, others a little bit at a time, and others never coming back, apparently. We don't like those chemicals. We are in and living through a workplace experiment, <coughs> and there are too, too many elements at play to call it just yet, <coughs> excuse me. It's just a game of watch and wait, which I can tell you, and you know, is painful. The customer at work used to say, if I only could get that nice coffee, that nice meal, that nice experience that I get in town, back home. Well, over COVID, that's happened because people would want that same thing in the town, and it's easy entry for those people setting up those stores and those new coffee shops. And they've got the footfall, because everyone is at home, walking their dog, that damn dog. Um, and now those people coming back two, three days a week want a little bit 
of what they had at home. So there is a definitely, for me, there is a hybrid situation. There's many companies we're talking to now that were at 1,000 and are now 250. What does that workplace look like for them? So at Fidditude, as I mentioned, we have flexibility and scalability. <coughs> we also have the underlying historical learnings for 15 years, which I can tell you has been hard work. Not always got it right. But from a CPU operation, we can have consistency and we can operate from out of there into the, into the cities. We have the ability to suddenly cater for numbers overnight. We can be in one day, gone the next, have us for two days, just the evening. It doesn't matter. My view is to open your doors and your minds. Think not fear, but embrace. Not to ignore, but find out more and explore. Collaborate with the competition, if you have to. Help each other. And I think everyone at the moment is in wants a win-win. I look at large, half-empty buildings and real estate just coming into London the last few weeks, an office floor space, as they are now firmly on the agenda. How could you fill that space? How could you future-proof those buildings? Could those space within those buildings house logistic hubs for grocery or shopping delivery companies that manage ghost stores like Gorillas or Bolt or Getir or I think someone said earlier, something puff, <laughs> go puff, <laughs> or delivery heroes. Fiditude can operate with no kitchen on site, something that was laughed at a few years back. But by taking out your kitchen, not only will you save on the equipment costs and maintenance, but you also free up space within those buildings to create those collaborative spaces that people need now. At the same time, you're reducing costs of staff. When we operate uh, a menu, what would normally take 10 chefs to create, we only need one on site. That's the difference to our model. And if you don't need us one day, you don't come in, it doesn't cost you. But I'm not saying it's the end of the canteen or cafeteria or staff restaurant. Sometimes I get pushed around for saying the wrong word there, but we know yeah, there's places to go and eat. On the contrary, I'm not here to shoot myself in the foot in front of catering teams, but could kitchens in large industrial parks or large offices start thinking about that space and working with their clients about making it a bit more exciting? Maybe food trucks outside, maybe, maybe even uh, using your kitchen to work with aggregators. And I know we're all scared of aggregators, but they're here. And if you think about the, the clients that were at home, it's the ease of operating, it's the ease of ordering. Some would say you don't get the personal service, but it's, it's that expectation level, I think, that everyone's coming back in. They want it, and they want it now, and they want it to be easy. So embrace tech. Dining no longer needs to be confined to a time or a place. But if it makes sense, the workplace, <coughs> uh, sorry, in the workplace, Create those meaningful places where people can comfortably eat or chill out. I don't need to spend out, spell out to you guys what the moving trends are, but if I look at what I've been around just recently, the old-fashioned till is dead. It's gone. It doesn't make any sense anymore to me. It's now all about ease of payment and apps, as I said. You can use tech to reduce your food waste. There's food lockers for convenience, micro-markets, Self-checkouts, meal kits at home, it's all happening in our space, and food to take home. The aggregators have repositioned themselves as, uh, I think, as uh, Deliveroo in business, there's Uber in business. They've seen that, obviously, these people are walking back and going back to work, and they don't want to lose that customer. So again, could you embrace that, um, that thinking and those people within your business? As much as it creates a bit of fear, it's the way things are going. I'm not here to teach you to suck eggs, so I'm, not, I'm certainly not there to do that. But, and I'm not saying what you haven't heard before, but if you join some of these dots up and throw them back at your own businesses or your working colleagues and the teams, how much of it sticks, how much of it resonates, and where are the gaps? 
because I think as an industry we all need to get together and hold tight. I'm not doing too bad. Almost out of water. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to change track a bit now. Um, one of the headlining subjects which uh, um, Chris and Lauren and Graham have mentioned is sustainability. Um, so sustainability, I'm just going to touch on for a moment, but it was the elephant in the room for our business for, for quite some time, and I'm quite embarrassed to admit that. In fact, actually, I was the, the problem within, in the room. <laughs> I was the elephant. Because I would use sustainability as a kind of nice word to use, and I thought that my clients would like to hear and my staff like to hear, but actually never really got behind it. Back in 2014, we recognised that as a food business, we were starting to make... Sorry, starting to take more from the environment than we restored. We started making sustainable changes within the business and took membership of the Sustainable Restaurant Association. However, we felt the need for a much bigger and measurable impact and we joined the Planet Mark in 2019. Since then, in our first year, we have made a 30% reduction in carbon emissions on a per meal basis. In 2021, owing to the effects of the pandemic and lower trading volumes, we've made an absolute reduction of 60%. But that doesn't really add up either because we need to still need to make improvements into 21 and 22. Building sustainable practices into the business is not an overnight process. It requires buy-in from every area of the business and constant evaluation. The support we have received from the Planet Mark and others allows us to do just that. I was on the floor once, uh, not so long ago, and I was uh, threw myself in the kitchen pot wash area, and I was appalled with the food that was only made that morning and that fresh produce I was actually putting in a bin, and I felt sick, sick to the stomach. And that's really kind of where we started. So my team set out an action plan we ensured that everyone in the business got heard and we all contributed. The task was immense, but we cut it down into small chunks and ingrained it into our way of life at Fooditude. We've made it our culture. It's now our backbone. Are we perfect? Nope. But there is an overall willingness to try and do it better and to keep going. We audited our food waste. We measured and we looked, took steps. It was hard work, and I'm in full credit to my team. So over here for carrying it on and pursuing with it. Some are easy decisions, like ensuring the menu, we used everything that was ordered, rescaling the team, educating, attending talks and seminars and getting informed. And with the great outfits like the SRA and the Planet Mark, we were on a new journey. We also worked closely with Olio, Guardians of Grub, to name a few. We installed Orca digestive machines into the kitchen and we've also got dishwashers that are waterless. Sustainability, for me, is a developing journey. It's about educating ourselves and being honest with the reality and our responsibility. I woke up from this pandemic and felt even more inspired to put, wrong, put right my wrongs. And to this end, I'd love to share a video of one of the three videos that we had um, worked with with Google and Planet Mark. These videos are now used, <coughs> excuse me, now used to help SMEs start the process of tackling sustainability at, sustainability at work. Google chose us for these as we were honest and upfront and we're on a journey. There's no point hiding or pretending it's gonna go away. It's a forever thing now. And now I'll play the video. When we started on our sustainability journey, we kind of thought of it as a nice to have, but it's actually become really integral to the business and a key driver for a lot of the decisions that we make. Feedback from our customers that sustainability was important to them really gave us the business case to pursue it. Now, a third of our business is from our connections with our sustainability partners. Measuring our environmental impact, for instance, the energy we use or the food waste that we have, has definitely shown how wasting those resources impacts the bottom line. We started small, so our HR department went paperless, and we also changed all the lighting in our offices so that they're all in motion sensors now. 
and that helped reduce our electricity consumption by 13%. Having made the business case for sustainability, it backs up all kinds of new purchases that we need to make. We have more energy efficient equipment in the kitchen, and we've invested in fuel efficient vans as well. It isn't just about the bottom line, it's also about building a culture around it in your company. It really helps with recruitment and retention, and it really gives something to celebrate. Uh, don't, don't, I'd like to get your feedback on what you thought about the video, but anyway, we've, we, um, for those consultants in the room, we, are, uh, we have an open day on the 18th of um, November. If you want to come and see me or one of my team after, we'd love to have you down to the kitchen. And if it doesn't fit for that date, we're very open at the kitchen. We, we, we'd like seeing guests. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for bearing with me. I never find these things easy. <laughs> and uh, if there's any questions, please feel free. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. That's really wonderful. And you did far better. I think <laughs> you thought. <laughs> really good. Um, we're going to, to, I'm sure you're going to be around for a bit later for, yes. for additional questions. Uh, we've got networking a bit later. Mm -hmm. But if I can bring Chris up, and we've got a wonderful panel that um, he's going to not interrogate. Um, more good news stories, I hope. Um, but if I could ask uh, Chris to take over. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. May I invite um, Helen, Ian, and Darren up to the stage, please? And please, anyone who has questions as we go, please put your hand up and we'll get a microphone across to you. Okay. So you've got, we've got three intro fascinating speakers or people to give us their comments now on how they see the market changing. Mm -hmm. Um, quickly again, Helen, UK Managing Director for Aramark. I'm sure you've all read the press releases during the course of the year from her, but previously was Head of Retail for Greggs, Head up M&S Simply Foods, and has worked with Breaks before joining Aramark as of January this year. So she's really be interested to see her views on her first year in tenure. Uh, Darren, um, you kind of country manager for the UK and Europe, which sounds a big country to me, uh, for the Russell Partnership, um, but was running concessions and commercial director at Expo 2020 Dubai. And again, that was a real market leader in, in sustainability. So interested, again, your observations of what you're seeing coming over here. And Ian, 16 years with Starbucks before joining Compass a few years ago, a couple of years ago now, is it? That's right, yeah. Um, chief marketing officer, running new food development and new channels as well. Um, it'd be interesting to see, and obviously, COP26, and, and I know sustainability is key to you. So let's start with that one on sustainability, if that's OK. Um, the research shows sustainability is obviously one of the major issues coming through. What are you finding from clients? What kind of feedback are you getting? Is it true? Is it reflecting the conversations you're having? Or are we still some way away? Well, it was no surprise, really, for, for me to see sustainability up there as, as, as number one and really pleased to see it up there as, as number one. So and I think the answer to your question is, is really a simple yes. We are hearing that in the same way as the survey said um, from clients. We really doubled down on sustainability um, at the beginning of the, of the year and have accelerated um, our activity in that space, partly but not only because we had COP uh, approaching. We, I was up there for the last three days. We uh, have catered um, all of the delegates uh, from uh, every single attendee there uh, over the last um, the last 13 days or so, and we were absolutely determined to make sure that that was the most sustainable COP from a food perspective um, that, has ever, that has ever been seen. Um, and uh, as a result of that, you know, we've seen that come through from clients as well. So, so the, the simple answer, Chris, is, is absolutely it's, it's a top item on the agenda across the board. Darren, and your perspective? Yeah, thank you, Chris. And a very interesting perspectives from Ian, having seen it firsthand, and I suppose you know, the power of these types of events becomes paramount, I think, in our, in our minds once you can see how this actually brings people together around a sustainability message. Uh, at Russell Partnership, we were fortunate enough to be commissioned to do a piece of work with Avanti West Coast Trains. Obviously, that uh, being part of this COP journey, as we were discussing uh, before getting up here, you know, just so that they could evaluate their position on sustainability and food. 
And I think that's one of the, the key items, Chris, to, to kind of get to in sustainability is, you know, we see the proliferation of policies and statements, but actually the measurables behind it are quite tricky. And the KPIs around sustainability are areas often disregarded by a lot of businesses that have strong ambitions. So I think what would be great from the Avanti work and, and obviously the, you know, hopefully the spill out from COP26 is that people actually take the time to get their measurables around sustainability and be open and honest about where their business is. Um, you know, Dean's point about how this is something that's on the radar of many and you know, the, the need to try and innovate around space is obviously in, in our minds. I think what was really interesting, the last perspective around coming back to the UK after being a few years in the UAE, different personalization of that sustainability message is key. You really have to understand your business and what your aspirations are around sustainability and try and move towards that. I don't think there's you know, a one-size-fits-all sustainability policy that we've encountered in this, in this industry. So it is about being personal about your ambition, trying to find a way to characterize that and, and move forward. So yeah, great, great points there. So Helen, moving to you, do you think clients are going to invest in this piece? Um, I mean, I suppose that's a nuance to the question, isn't mm. it, Chris? Um, for us, I don't know about anybody else in here, it was about a learning experience to start with. What is net zero? What's carbon neutral? What are all these new things? And we certainly had to have training sessions with our teams, so we had conference calls to talk through it so that when we were getting those client questions, we could answer them with a bit of authority as well because it was a big learning curve for us. Um, and we're putting together um, a whole piece of work, as you might imagine at the moment, um, to look at what we're doing in this area. Um, but I would say that there is going to be a difference, and I think it will evolve because at the moment everybody is coming out with quite bold targets by certain years and certain amounts, but I don't think there is the understanding yet across our industry and the client base as to what does that really mean and why is it really important to them. And so I think as time progresses and we all understand much more about it and what parts of it are most important for us and our clients, it will really evolve. Um, and it's also important that we do the right thing because it is the right thing to do, not because we're wanting to tick something or do something because everybody else is doing that as well. And so it's what's important to me and my UK team. What are we passionate about? I'm making sure that that's included in there too. Now, staying with you, Helen, obviously, listen to Kate. We've got some challenges coming out, which is quite clear. The next year is going to be a rough ride. What's keeping you awake at night? What's concerning you? I suppose um, I, I was laughing before because um, Graham was giving his presentation and there was one person, wasn't there, that said, in 2022, our business is going to have really grown versus 2019. <laughs> I think that was probably me because I am ever the optimist. I will always look on the sort of positive side of things. So I thought, oh, I've really messed up the data stats from there. Um, so in terms of what keeps me awake at night, um, I suppose in all honesty, it's my two children that always keep me <laughs> up at night, but um, to do with work, um, I suppose it's the team and the people and, um, you know, we hear the message from the hospitality industry that the teams were on furlough and yes, that's certainly right in B&I, the teams were on furlough, but for us, and thousands of our colleagues worked all the way through. Um, and so for them, in terms of having to homeschool and look after elderly uh, relatives at the same time as trying to work in some really difficult situations in hospitals and defense sites, for example. That's been really tough on them. Um, and coming out the other side of it now, they're tired. Um, and we need to make sure we do a great job of, of looking after them as well in terms of that health and wellness scored really highly, didn't it? Um, and mental health. Uh, you know, we've just brought in mental health champions to try and alleviate some of this, give them colleagues to speak to as well. Um, but for me, it is all about the people. Uh, you know, we don't have any control over the economy, unfortunately. But as a leader, the only thing we can really influence is our own leadership uh, and our own team culture. Um, so that's the one that I will constantly be thinking about. I'll come back to you on that. Um, Darren, from your point of view, what changes are you seeing that are taking place to kind of combat the kind of challenges we're facing? Yeah, I think, I think businesses that um, recognize the challenging position that they were in around things like data, you know, the, their use of a labor pool that was probably not sustainable in their minds long term, you know, hopefully they're finding their way through this in terms of, you know, what keeps us up at night. I, I think the hunger in the industry to find ways to improve is quite amazing. And again, going back to the, the, the wonderful words we got, you know, through pain comes innovation, I think is what you said. And it was, it was quite interesting to kind of hear that because... I do think there's a number of people, I'm sure, within this room and across the industry as a whole, 
who are desperately seeking what that future will hold for their business and, and they're trying to find ways to lead people and to maneuver their way through this very complex position. And so I think for us, you know, when, when we're working into a position now to try and help businesses come through this, there's a need for urgency and, and that, that's quite challenging. I think everyone's trying to find that, that immediate way to, to move forward. But if we heard, any, heard anything today, excuse me, um, there, there are no quick fixes and I don't think that the, you know, the horizon in the very near term is going to just open up and the business is going to return to normal. So I think the, the point that finally to make there and just to extend on the, the longevity behind sustaining this, this current situation for everyone here is quite challenging. You know, there's a need for everyone to look at their immediate situation, but to keep the energy level up when everyone's been fighting for so long is, is quite tricky and I think a lot of operators are feeling that pressure. No, I think that's fair. I mean, Ian, it looks like it's going to be a two to three year recovery process. Is that fair? I mean, well, I mean, I, uh, I think the first thing to say is, as, as you saw on the slides there, there's been certain sectors which have been working incredibly hard over the last 12, 18, 24 months. Healthcare, uh, you know, education has been working very hard to maintain services in school. Our defence business has been very... Uh, busy as well. And so, you know, we talk about um, this industry often through the lens of business and industry, but as uh, we've just heard there, there have been people in our industry that have been absolute heroes for the last 18 to 20 months, and it's really important, I think, that we, we, we recognise that. And then, as I think Kate mentioned earlier, I think that um, the pandemic has accelerated some changes that were happening already. Um, hybrid working was already starting to become increasingly common. Mondays and Fridays were lower volume than midweek, so I think we've seen that in a, a lot of places as well. There was already a movement towards digital innovation and operating in a COVID safe way it gave a real reason, a real need, a real consumer benefit to having a digitally enabled operation. And I think what the onus is on us as we come out of the pandemic is to really maintain the focus on what is it that's of real value for the consumer in things like digital innovation. Because as the need for COVID, self -operation, COVID safe operations sort of which was one of the enablers of that digital movement sort of subsides, we are going to have to find some real reasons for people to come in. But the value aspect is key. And what I think we're hearing from clients a lot is that the food proposition in offices, in businesses, the value of that has been really appreciated over the pandemic and particularly as people are coming back. And the fact that the ability to be able to attract people back into the workplace through great food offer, the ability to be able to showcase sustainability through food, a very visible part often of a business's sustainability initiatives can be through their food offering as well. So look, I think there are real signs of optimism there, and I think there are real reasons why the food offer in all of our environments as increasingly seen as a real value add. And I think clients are seeing that. And I think that partnership element that was mentioned uh, as part of the report is going to be an increasing part of the relationship between the client and, and the provider there. All right, two points on that one. Coming to you, Helen, touching on that. Yeah, clients, food is in key. And I think the research is showing that people are spending more time on site, more time staying on site and spending more potentially. Will clients invest more? Will there be a shift back towards more cost plus contracts or at least more investment in contracts? Yeah, I think, I think you're probably right, Chris. And I think we are seeing um, that change in, in working habits and we're seeing a change in financial models. Um, I suppose the, the first point is, you know, as, as a b &I industry, it, is it our job to persuade our clients that those um, colleagues should be out back into the offices five days a week? Um, or is it our role to innovate and make sure that we can still take the same revenues and margin from having those people on site two or three days a week? Um, because actually when we think about it from a more sort of holistic point of view, actually is that a positive thing for a number of people to be able to have that flexibility? Are we really listening to our clients and making sure that we're innovating? And we're certainly seeing much longer days when people are in the office, so we've got more meal points, so we're maybe taking breakfasts and dinners as well as just lunch before, um, and that spend per head that Kate talked about before, that's certainly much higher. 
Um, so it's, I suppose it's about us just adapting to the situation that we're now in, um, because I don't think we will have that full recovery by 2022. So we need to find new ways of, of innovating and, and making that happen for ourselves. Um, in terms of cost plus models, we're certainly seeing clients wanting that flexibility and us wanting that um, flexibility and safety net as well of the kind of models that we used traditionally and I suppose were a bit out of fashion for a little while and then have now since very much come back in and I think we, we would say that as an industry is we, we're seeing quite a lot of that now. How long that is here to stay, um, it certainly seems to be going into 2022 at this point. Um, with people still feeling a little unsure. Um, and Dean mentioned there is, would there be another lockdown? You know, that's still at the back of people's minds. Um, so protecting themselves and extending out those contracts moving forwards, I think that's what we're seeing quite a bit of. Interesting. Darren, your views on commercial models? Yeah, quite interesting. You know, then the, the cost plus model is a, is a favorite of days gone by. I think that's absolutely appropriate. I, I'd say that there's a, an interesting point here just about managing those cost plus contracts. And I'm wondering if you know, the, the many clients that we work across are prepared to take that on board because it, it does require a reframing of their own internal resource to be able to manage that appropriately. I don't know if they're, you know, if they're active in terms of governing those types of agreements as they would have been before. So there's a whole type of skills um, requirement, I think, around some of the industry that not just on the side of the table of the catering provider, but on the client side as well to make sure those are, are operated really, really well and for everybody's benefit. But I do think that the emergence of them, again, is key because it protects both sides in a fairly uh, turbulent period of time, which is important as well. And with labor cost pressures and supply chain pressures, you know, at least everyone can kind of be transparent about what, what the costs actually look like and move forward. Uh, at the same time, um, you know, I, I think there are increasing initiatives around partnerships and trying to work together in new and you know, hopefully bold ways. I think, again, hope there's partners out there that are looking for um, a, a greater share of value or a greater sense of value to whoever they're catering towards. Uh, but how that emerges in, in some of this uncertainty is quite tricky because everyone some, at some point has to make that commitment and kind of get on board with it, knowing that in two or three years, this uh, again, hopefully in terms of that recovery period, things could change quite substantially again. Ian. And how about consumer behaviours? Because one of the big discussion pieces is how consumer behaviours may have changed. Are you seeing change? Yes, I think I mentioned. I think that we've seen nudges or accelerations of consumer behaviour change that, that's happened. Uh, they've accelerated uh, the consumer change. And then there's new things that, that have come in. Um, sustainability, you know, not only from uh, operators and clients, but also from consumers is going to become increasingly important. We're looking at labelling the menus with carbon footprint data. We did that up at COP. We've got some trials going on with the guys at LEAP, Oxford University, to see how that changes uh, consumer um, behaviour um, in more time in the office. Um, I think but also the appreciation of a really well-cooked meal in the office. I don't know about you, but I've had my fill of cheese and and, uh, and mayonnaise sandwiches from the back of the fridge that I've managed to grab between moments of Teams or Zoom calls um, uh, uh, fleetingly at, at my desk at home. And, and, and I think that's going to be the same um, in many other people as well. And there's a lot of talk about collaboration, people coming into the office to collaboration. And what better way to collaborate than over some fantastic food and beverage um, and that, that comes back to the you know the value proposition and the recognition of the value that I think clients have have maybe rediscovered um, over the pandemic the recognition of the value that the food offer on site has for, for their business and employees um, whether it be just part of the, the value proposition for employees or whether it be to enable enable that collaborative working on site. So yeah, I think an acceleration of existing trends, but some, some new nudges in there maybe, maybe as well. Can I just touch on localism? Because obviously localism has been something that has been a major discussion point over the last 18 months. But at the same time, we've got real challenges, haven't we, of inflation and supply chain. Your thoughts in on that? Is, is localism now central? In, that... Intrinsic to our net zero commitments, you know, and we, we came out with those earlier earlier this year, and um, uh, we can't do that um, without recognising the fact that our, our food needs to be seasonal, our ingredients need to be seasonal, and it needs to come 
um, from more local sources. 80% um, of the food we've served up at COP over the last couple of weeks has been Scottish provenance, and 80% of that has come within 100 miles of the venue um, itself. The rest is all from, from the re outside, you know, in the rest of the, U the UK. Um, I think the seasonality aspect is as important as the local, local aspect. Um, there's no doubt about it. But we, yeah, we, I mean, menu engineering um, is absolutely part of one of the, you know, the big levers that we will be leveraging to, to deliver our net zero commitments and, and, and seasonal, great tasting seasonal produce sourced um, locally is, is a, a really critical part of that. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. If I, can, if I can just kind of go on to that thought, and, and you'd mentioned something about customer habits before, and it's quite interesting, this confluence of, you know, customers who've been trained to expect certain things, uh, like fresh produce all or, uh, of all sorts all around the year, and then menus can obviously filter into that. There's some, some work, I think, on all parts to try and untrain some of the customer habits that have been built perhaps over the past decades. That could be on pricing, and I know, you know we, everyone's a fan of the Big Mac in, Index and the Economist, and you know, if you look at the price of some of the, the food offers in the UK, I think we've been so competitive against the, in the marketplace that sometimes that we've eroded margins and actually hampered some of the industry right now, but equally around training customers to expect you know, the full range of offer to be available all the time. It's quite tricky. I think the effort on all parts to try and retrain what customers can expect is going to be a very important part. Helen, obviously culture and people is something that is very important to you. We obviously face some major challenges on talent. Do we need to rethink the way we look at the whole picture? I mean, what we heard from Kate before was there's no silver bullet, unfortunately, is there? Um, and we're certainly struggling, as the rest of the industry is, in terms of vacancies. Um, I do see um, the wage inflation being a positive thing, actually, uh, for our frontline colleagues, because I think what it's um, forced all of us to do is, is rise up um, to what essentially is quite a difficult industry to, to change, because we're competing against each other constantly for these um, bids and tenders, and although in our tenders we would put in um, different wage rates and, and hope the client would go for a higher one, in reality, unfortunately, cost wins out a lot of times. So, it's a really positive thing, I think, for a lot of our frontline colleagues that that's happening. Um, it's certainly going to challenge us to be creative and have to have conversations with clients and think about how we mitigate against some of that. But I think it's good that it's challenged us as a whole industry to do more on that side. Um, in terms of recruitment in, um, I think one of the things that Kate was saying about before was that um, you know those salaries are more important than ever. ever. And I, th I think that's true, but I think uh, what's more important is the culture and the team that what someone wants to work in and, and how it makes them feel and how we look after um, the teams that we've got and I suppose the, the authenticity that you have as a business, what do you stand for? Um, and certainly, you know, as we've been recruiting quite heavily over the last few months into new board positions in the UK, um, I, I really like it when people come through and, and we've got a couple in the room today and, and challenge me in terms of, you know, what are you trying to create in terms of a culture? What does your sustainability look like? What's important to you? And do you really mean it? Are you standing behind it? And so, yes, salary and package is important, but actually I think people are now wanting to work more with purpose and they want to find a home that feels like they'll su they get support with that. Yeah, very fair. So I'm running out of time. Final question. How's the sector going to change in the next three years? To me, Chris. Might as well start, yeah. <laughs> um, I would hope the sector's going to change because we would work more in collaboration, um, in partnership with some of our clients. I would like to see us sharing a bit more in terms of best practice. And certainly there's some brilliant models out there. There was um, a Bartlett Mitchell one, actually, I don't know where Ian is, um, in terms of mosaic. And I was like, wow, wish I'd have, um, wish I'd have come up with that. Um, so there's quite a lot that we could maybe share more um, in terms of supporting each other and things. And um, certainly everyone's been really welcoming to me, only joining in January and joining a whole new, new industry out of retail. I think that's been really positive. Um, and so I think in terms of how do we work together with the consultants and, and the clients, making sure that we're as bespoke and tailored as possible. I think the sort of the overarching propositions might fade away a little bit and we might uh, learn to have to listen more to clients to make sure we're creating something very bespoke and very individual for each one rather than shoehorning in what we think is going to fit them. Fair play. Darren? 
Well, I mean, what's not, what's not going to change, right? So, uh, yeah, qu quite remarkable. And, and with the crystal ball in front of us here, you know, I, I think um, a lot of the operations we're facing, again, have been in very data poor positions. And I think the drive for efficiency is pushing many businesses to try and reinvest in their systems to understand their current positions and, and assess their current, you know, their current operation in different ways. And part of that's the need. Part of that's just the, the urgent need to try and, you know, evaluate how to make good decisions at this very turbulent moment. But hopefully that gives the industry a bit more of a, I guess, a data-rich position to be in as they emerge from this. And that efficiency drive could be quite an effective thing long term just to maintain competitiveness, even in the face of higher wages and, and potentially some, some long-standing inflationary pressure. So I do think there, there is a return uh, on the horizon in, in a couple of years' time. I do think there's a, a great chance for businesses to come out of this in a, in a much better position around people, skills development, uh, and obviously data being a key one. I do think there's a bit of a, uh, a bit of work to do on that, uh, I guess, the collaboration piece, but maybe even on industry brand. I, I know that sounds a bit silly, but you know, we're, we're doing a, a bit of work with colleges in the city here, where they've got 50% um, size group cohort of catering and, and kind of, um, I guess, staff in that or students, excuse me, in that cohort that would have been 150 students is now 75 going into catering schools, and and so I think that pressure on the industry with a skills shortage when we're not kind of filling up the, the bottom of that, of that uh, element is quite key. So whether that's students not wanting to go into this field because it's just misrepresented in terms of what it offers, whether we've not all done enough to try and raise the profile of the great, you know, the great careers you can have in this industry, there's a bit of work to do on kind of industry brand and that health. Yeah, that's fun. Ian. Well, it's hard to add to those two, um, <laughs> isn't it? But I think there are, yeah, there are a couple of things that maybe underpin both of the great points that have already been, been made. I think there will be a doubling down of what has already been a great history of investment in people. I mean, and what an industry. I mean, it's an industry where pot washers become CEOs and business owners. Um, and uh, uh, investment, as, as Kate said, in apprentices coming through and in the training of those individuals from whatever background is something that we're almost uniquely placed to be able to, to do. And it's brilliant, isn't it? Because it's a 40-hour working week for most cases, um, Dean, and you don't have to um, work late nights at hotels um, in, in all sectors. So although you know, clearly we have some, some sectors that do that, do that as well. So I think we, we will see a doubling down on, on that as an enabler to it and the proliferation of new models that are going to be um, enabled by digital and data um, in terms of delivering client-specific requirements, but doing so in a, in a, in a highly efficient and smart, and smart way. Um, I think we'll see that coming through as well. Great. May we say thank you to our three speakers, please. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, they'll, be, they'll be hanging around for coffee, so please come and um, ask any questions that you'd like of them, please. Thank you. Laura, over to yourself. Thank you, Chris. Just a quick... Thank you to everyone for joining us this morning. I'm very aware of time. As Chris mentioned, we are, if you would like, going out onto the lawn to um, have our moment silence. And you're welcome to come back. Downstairs will be available to you to network or you know, do your business calls for as long as you want. Um, I just wanted to patch Graham back in to do a quick thank you and goodbye. Um, so, Graham, over to you. Thanks, Lauren. Um, and yeah, no, it's just uh, an opportunity to say thanks, first of all, to everybody in the room for continuing to support this event. Whilst I've only been doing it virtually, it's great to see a, a full room uh, here of people enjoying this in person. So thank you for that. Uh, we do appreciate the support. Um, also to the speakers and panelists for taking the time out of the uh, the day and, um, and also sharing some you know, kind of personal stories there. And uh, Dean, you did a great job. Um, even if you were worried about it, that was uh, it was fantastic and, and good to hear the personal side of that. Um, and uh, finally, thanks, of course, to to Chris and um, Lauren for for stepping up in my absence to host things on, on the ground on the day and all the work that goes into arranging it in the first place. So um, yeah, no, listen. Thank you very much to everybody, and uh, I wish you all well for the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Travel safe and we'll see you soon. <laughs>